Oh, what, yes. Oh, thank you, Diane. Um, I'm Carrie Grogan, pastor of Christ Church Uniting Disciples and Presbyterians in Kailua. And I was wondering if you could speak to um, how you don't give in to despair, or, or, or if you do, um, how, how you come out of the other side of that. Um, just in, in, in speaking of you know the context of our country right now and two long drawn out wars um, and Guantanamo and those things. Um, I, lately, I've just found myself sort of feeling like I give up. Yeah. And so, how how do you keep from giving into that? Well, let me admit. Um, that I had come to that point of giving up um, lots of times. Um, and every time that I did come through it was not because um, I sort of remembered the ideals we were fighting for. This is a struggle for democracy or think of the past, so many people have tried this and, and it's still going on. Um, there's two things, I think, that helped me through it. Uh, one, really has to, one really has to have faith um, in understanding that having faith means a constant battle against despair. And understanding that hopelessness is a very real thing, it's also our greatest enemy. It's also the devil's greatest temptation. Once you begin to despair and you really believe that that really there's nothing you can do, um, then then you've lost. If not the battle that is lost, you are lost for the battle. Um, and that's a terrible thing because there are other people. Um, in probably much dire, more, much more dire circumstances than I have been who had managed to hold on. The second thing I think is uh, one usually says by the grace of God, but, and that's true, but I have found that the grace of God always comes to one in the form of another person. I've never had an experience about the grace of God where I just sort of sat by my own and I had this revelation. Oh, sometimes you pray, that's true. Um, and through prayer, one regains one's strength. Um, but, but it's always somebody else. It comes in different ways. I would, I would, I would go on a, on a march not really wanting to because I was really very tired. Um, I didn't see the end. It was difficult for me, people like me, who are supposed to lead um, in the struggle. And so you, you make all these speeches, and you're supposed to inspire other people. And you're supposed to let them see uh, how much you believe. Or I must say, it's very hard sometimes. Um, sometimes I sort of say to myself, Okay, so I'm very scared right now. Somebody told me once, and I met him years and years later, that we had a demonstration once that started from St. George's Cathedral in the heart of Cape Town, where Archbishop Tutu was. Many of our demonstrations started then. We go right down Adley Street and so forth. And, and he said he was working for some organization, and it was the building of the Board of Executors, who I remember. And they were looking from the 20th floor or so, they were looking down, and he says, they were talking to each other, there was a demonstration, I was about 20 feet ahead of everybody else, and then came the first row uh, of people. And he asked me, weren't you afraid? I said, sure I was. But I couldn't show it. Because if other people depended on you, um, to really make this happen today and to say, okay, even whatever it is that they're going to do, uh, I have to take the risk first. Um, and I was dead scared. And sometimes I thought, 
or just take the next step and bluff them out in the name of Jesus because that's, that's, that's all you could do all you could do but then of course you really do learn um, what it means to, to really have trust in God because we have no guarantees of what would happen but you know that if you, if you give up um, on the belief that, that this is going to become true for our people then if you give up on that then um, too much is lost so somehow God sends somebody to you it's a young person who, uh, who is willing to risk even more than you are um, it's a mother who made you promise that you will honor the memory of a child and she doesn't mean go out there and kill a white person for me she means just remain faithful um, strange things have happened. I mean, I, <clears throat> as you can hear, I have not just a pastor's affliction with my voice. And my daughter says, don't complain, it's all your fault. You speak too long anyway. So, <laughs> so um, at one time I lost my voice. And, and some of the people knew that. And, um, she drove, so she asked her son to drive her about 300 miles to come and visit me in my office. And I was talking like this. And she came in, she said to me, I've just come to pray with you. Because I've said to God, don't let him lose his voice. Because who will then speak for us? And so God cannot do this because your voice has to be heard. I remember it was during Pentecost and during Pentecost we have a 10 day week of services every night. And so of course the strain, and I use my voice wrong, I've never had proper voice training, you know, all of that. And so I will never forget when it came to the Sunday and we have the last service of that day, my voice came back strong. I've had trouble with my voice since then. Never lost it. So God's grace came to me in the form of that woman and she didn't want to stay long. She did the prayer. Didn't pontificate about nothing. Didn't tell me now you got to believe or nothing like that. <laughs> she prayed for me. She prayed with me and then she asked the son to drive her back. But, but that was the grace of God. And then I remember, you've got to be more careful with your voice. So watch what you do. Don't go out in the cold without, because you really don't speak for yourself. And so that helped me. If she believed that at the end there is something that we're going to get, but you've got to help us through this, then I have to believe too. And then, of course, other times, and I, and I always tell this to people, um, and here in the United States, I tell it with great gratitude. You sometimes don't know, and I'm sure you will hear the same from Desmond Tutu. You don't know what it meant to us. Not just to know that you were standing up in church assemblies and in general synods, you were making difficult decisions about what to do with your money in order to support us. Divestment debates were not easy debates. We created division amongst you guys and so we always pray to God to forgive us, but to let it happen anyways. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, I've come to the United States so often in those days to work very, very hard. But one of the things that I came here gladly was because there were so many people in the churches who really did that. Who went and demonstrated in front of the South African embassy. And they went to prison. And then they were always saying to us, oh, of course, my one night in prison. I know they can never do this and that. They can't torture me. I said, but you know what? It doesn't really matter. You go there and let me be selfish. It's all right. Go to jail for one night. I count the number of people who did that during one week. And that, if I count the South African Embassy counts also. <laughs> With every one of you, they say, oh my goodness, this thing is getting difficult, much more difficult to handle. But whenever you do that, when we used to come here, I mean, we used to be surrounded with so much love. And I used to tell you this, the way I saw that, 
And sometimes I came here and I was so tired and so exhausted. I've been in the ministry for f over 40 years now. I've never had more than three weeks of vacation. I don't know such a thing as a sabbatical. Wow. And I'm not bragging because one shouldn't brag about this. It's not a good example for anybody. <laughs> you take your sabbatical. You take your period of rest and your church must make sure that you do. Um, you don't have to be uh, rung out like me. And as far as I can see, um, it didn't get me any extra rewards. I'm still waiting. <laughs> but seriously, so you come here, you're so exhausted. But I go back so energized. And I wondered why. And then I thought of that story in the Bible. You remember in the Gospels the man who was lame, who couldn't get to Jesus by himself, and then he was brought by his friends. And how they had to battle through that crowd that stood outside of the house. And finally they had to climb up the wall. I could see this in my mind's eye. And they're scrambling up the wall one by one. And then they pulled this guy up. And then they had to make a hole in the roof. Banging on the roof while Jesus was talking down there. And so it's all right. Well, even while Jesus is talking, you bang on the roof. It's okay. You wait until that hole is there. Then they let their friend down. And when Jesus healed him, the Bible says, and when Jesus saw their faith, and I always thought, my goodness, that's right. This guy had no faith left anymore. It all took too long. He was too tired. There were too many promises that were never kept. There were too many hopes that were never realized. How much has he prayed for healing and it never happened? He has given up. So when the time came and they took him to Jesus, he went there not believing a thing. He didn't go there because he thought this wonderful Jesus was there, he's going to heal me. He just went because he couldn't sit up by himself and walk away. He had no choice. And so against his own lack of faith, they took him there. But they kept on believing and they led him through the roof. And so I often felt that I was like that man. And people here in the United States, you kept on praying and you kept on hauling us up the wall and you kept on banging on the roof and you made that hole and when Jesus saw your faith, Jesus helped us. That's how I feel. So that, that kept me from despair. Those things. Aloha. I'm, I feel honored to be here. My name is Frank Jarling. I'm an, I attend uh, Tamo Kapili Church. I'm not a, a minister, <laughs> but uh, we're glad to have been invited. Um, this is an entirely different subject, I think. Um, when you see someone's name on the, on, the, on the roster of speakers and you don't recall that name, you'll, the, the initial reaction is to Google them and see and see. <laughs> Who is this person and where does he come from and what does he do? And one of the things that I did notice was uh, when I came across your name was your, uh, I guess, somewhat interesting views on the uh, um, Israel-Palestine uh, situation and your views towards Israel, which I think more and more people are having. But uh, I'm not sure. I just if it doesn't, if it's not going to take too long, I'd like to hear what what, what your views on that are. Thank you. Um, well, it all began um, well in our struggle. Of course, um, people who struggle around the world feel a sort of a a natural bond of solidarity with other people who struggle for justice and for freedom. And we understand so well what they are going through because of what we are going through. Um, but sometimes um, in the South African struggle, you get so wrapped up with your own things. It is such a huge thing. It, it swallows you up every single day. I mean, um, and you forget about responsibilities to family and all of that because of the struggle is. And you sometimes forget about other people as well. And so in the early 1980s, um, and we have a strong Muslim community in South Africa, and, and, and they were with us in the struggle um, in many, many ways. So that connection has always been there, but it has to be real. I mean, I can't believe in freedom for Palestinians via 
the Muslim community. I have to embrace that for myself. In our struggle, there were also um, Jewish uh, people who, who made uh, sacrifices. Um, and so I thought of them, and I thought of the Palestinians, and I began to look differently at the situation. I began to see if they can struggle with us, it creates such a different situation, but what about Palestine? What's happening there? So in the early 1980s, I was privileged to go with a delegation, and we went to Lebanon. I could never be allowed into Israel. The Israeli government always stopped me. Um, I went to Israel for the first time two years ago. And I'm not sure that they'll allow me back. <laughs> I've, I've, I've said some things since then. Um, but I went to Lebanon, I went to Shatia camp. And those of you who remember that, um, it was one of the most revelatory experiences of my life. Um, and when we came there and we walked from tent to tent, and there was this one woman uh, who invited us in, and she offered us coffee. And of course, you have to look around, where can I sit, where can I sit, it's just a tent. But she had this little chest, wooden chest in her corner, and, and she says, this is all I could get. And she had been driven out of Israel, and, um, and out of that she took uh, these small little cups that she cherished so much, and she, saying, this is what my mother uh, got from my grandmother, and I'm so glad I still have this. And so she served us coffee and she told her family story. Well, it's a story of hundreds and thousands of people since the Nakba. Um, and then I realized I really have no right to speak just about our situation. I realized that justice is indivisible as God is indivisible, as God's love is indivisible. And so if I stand up for justice in our struggle, which was a racial justice struggle, I have to stand up for the struggle of Palestinians. If I believe that the only way forward for us was justice and, and, um, and the embrace of one another so that white and black could live together in one country because we have to share that future together, then I have to believe that this must be possible for Palestinians because what was happening then and what is happening now is totally, totally unthinkable before God. And I've always, when I, whenever I see atrocities, I, I think of the story of Babel that we talked about this morning. Isn't this one verse that God says, when God sees how they all think alike, and are bent on this one thing, just the glory of the tower, to hell with everything else. Um, because they had the, the, the connection with their gods and the sanction was there. Then God says an amazing thing. God says, now that they have all this, nothing is going to be impossible for them. And the more I think about that, I think of the atrocities in history, and I think God was right. God was right to be so afraid. Things that are unthinkable for God, we make possible for us. That's when we talk about radical evil. We do things that God deems impossible, unthinkable, but we make it possible. Um, so ever since then, I embrace the Palestinian cause, and now I see. Now I see so many parallels between what is happening now. It really, it really is an apartheid state. There's no doubt about that, um, and in many cases, it's much worse. We never had a wall, physical wall, that was built through our properties and through our homes. The whites would take us away and throw us away somewhere. But there was never a physical wall that said to me, this is now white South Africa, you can't go in there. They killed us in other ways, but I stood at the wall when I was there two years ago, and I, I saw what other people were telling us about mothers with sick children who can't get 
through the checkpoint to the hospital. Um, the water that was cut off, the land that is being taken, the products that we now buy that says coming from Israel that come from the occupied territories, the, the Arabs who cry for their land as we do for ours. It's the same thing. Well, what drives me now, I've just told you how I felt when I came to the United States and you guys were so supportive. You were on the streets for us, you stood up and you spoke for us, you did divestment for us. I turn around and I look in the world, what is worse in Palestine than apartheid ever was, is we always had international ecumenical solidarity. They don't. We could always turn to the churches, who do they turn to? There's nobody here. Um, all, they, all, they, all they hear from the Christian church is the Zionists, the Christian Zionists, and that awful distortion of God's word. The talk of violence as if their obliteration is all God wants. Um, we never had that. So in many ways, the Palestinian situation is much worse than the apartheid situation. And, and I, I, I hope that what you say is right, that more and more people are realizing this. As much as the apartheid, the well, the civil rights situation here was the, the litmus test for our faithfulness. And as much as the apartheid struggle became that listless, there's how the way Christians reacted to apartheid told us how much their faith was worth to them. That situation pertains today in the Middle East. How we respond to the plight of the Palestinians, and let me say, to the plights of the Jews who stand with them against all odds. I mean, and that's another thing that makes me so feel so strongly about that country. There are Jews there, the mothers, for instance, who mourn for the soldiers. They stand together. The, the, the Jewish groups for peace and the Palestinian groups for peace. They might be the minority, but I think we mentioned the name Bayez Nodir. Bayez Nodir was an Afrikaner who grew up in the Afrikaans community. He was from the upper echelons of, of the Afrikaans community. He was um, the moderator of the Dutch Reformed Church. He was all of that. He had all the right credentials. And, and they were getting ready to sort of move him even higher up. And in the midst of all of that, when Sharpville came and he saw the consequences of his privilege, he turned his back on all of that, and they stripped him of his ministry, they threw him out of the church, they deriled him, they defiled his name, they, they, they ostracized him. They thought they ostracized him from everything, but they did not. They simply cut him off from themselves. But with us, uh, he found a loving community. Um, and he was uh, a hero for us. And I think there are Jews who do the same thing. And who go through all of that process because they stand with the Palestinians. And I think they deserve better than we, the church, are giving them right now. And so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you are right. But it is a, it is a, it, it is a thing of understanding that justice is indivisible. Because I understand that, it's the same reason why I could stand for gender justice and why I could stand for sexual justice. God's love is not divisible. If you embrace the one God of mercy, you embrace the one God of mercy for all of God's children. I have no right to draw a line and say, I love that God, but that God, no thank you. I can't, I can't do that. So my question is, we hope you return renewed and refreshed, but um, reflecting upon what would be your moment closest to Christ since you've been in Hawaii, where you felt the Holy Spirit the deepest. Oh, wow. Um, 
There have been a few such moments, but I must say, because it's different um, in Maui, um, is it Kewalia Church? Kewalia Church. Um, when they, when I first hear, uh, heard the music, and when uh, they stood up and they sang that South African song, Sia Humba. Now last Sunday I preached, and, but they destroyed me totally. <laughs> Um, because they sang to Mamina, and many of you know that. And I say to them, I mean, you sing the song, and it's wonderful, but you know, people think when we sing that song, it's some mission song. It isn't a mission song. Um, we sang that song at the funeral um, of the children and of others. And so at the end of the funeral, uh, when we send the people away, we sing. First, at the funeral, we sing Sen Zenina, Sen Zenina, which means what have we done? What have we done? And then we sing Tuma Mina because you're now going away from the grave, right? But tomorrow there'll be a new demonstration. Tomorrow there'll be a new confrontation. Tomorrow other people will be killed. You might be in the line of fire. So they say Tuma Mina, Tuma Mina, and goes Yom, which means send me Lord. Send me Jesus, send me Lord. Doesn't matter where you send me, even if I'm alone, even if I want to run away, there's a struggle going on. Send me, Lord. Don't send other, other people. Send, send me, Lord. So we sing to Mamina. So on Sunday they sang that song. And as I get older, I don't know about you guys, but as I get older, I get um, very, as my mom used to say, very light on petrol. Um, <laughs> I cry more easily than I used to. Um, I get more emotional than I used to. I have to look away, find some other thing to talk about for a couple of seconds before I can look the congregation in the eye. You know how that goes. Um, and But th that was on Sunday, but my wife and I have been talking. One rarely, as one travels, find in groups of people um, a spirit that touches you so deeply and that, and that, and that calls you back. Um, and I've, I've found that here. My family has. Andrea is um, a child who's very close to her parents. I remember lots of times those the exciting moments of sleep over, sleep over, sleep over. Well, by nine o'clock, we get a phone call. The <laughs> fun is over when I come home. <laughs> she doesn't like staying away from her parents. Andrea slept with two people last night who have become friends just, just, just in this past week. Now, how often does that? She stays today. She's going fishing. <laughs> she has no... Quarrel with her parents going wherever it is you're going. I want to stay here with Uncle Taka and Auntie Ellen. I mean, it's like when your kids feel like that, then you know. There must be something in people, right? Uh, um, I'm cynical, so I see stuff in you. Uh, oh no. <laughs> but, but, but. Children are not like that. If something, is, if something is off, they will never come close to people. But when they embrace people the way my child has embraced all of you, since, since we came to Kona, I mean, yeah, there, there is Charles. Uh, Andrea was with the youth all day long. She said, we never, we had, we had dinner the first evening together when we flew in. That was the last time. <laughs> And she would rush up to the hotel room, knock on the door quickly. Dad, oh yes, sir, um, I, I've got to ask you something. But while she's asking, she's already going to her suitcase. We're going to take her for a swim tonight. We're not going to be, uh, we won't be late, but I will thank you guys. Bye, see you. <laughs> <laughs> that child is a child that has blossomed right now. Wow. And you've done that. So yeah, I feel um, this is a place, and this is no hint as subtle as I am. <laughs> but this is a place where we can come back to. Um, for all sorts of reasons. 
Um, and I thank God for you. And uh, my mother, I, I think I quoted you this morning. My mother says, I was, I preached one day and somebody was giving me a compliment. And my mother sat there. And she said, now listen, there's nothing to brag about. It's a gift from God. If it's a gift from God, you don't brag about it. Just <laughs> shut up. Don't say anything. <laughs> so well, I'm saying to you, don't say a word. But truly, truly. Um, we have found a spirit in this place that, uh, that has embraced us in ways and I don't have time to tell you all of the stories. There were moments um, because of what I say and what I stand for and what I feel compelled to do. Um, my own country has become a very difficult place in many ways. My own church has become a very difficult place. Um, and so you walk around in life with some apprehension because like everybody I'm afraid to get hurt again but when you come into a place and you feel all the defenses fall away and you don't need to find any new defenses it just happens that's a gift from God so thank you I really appreciate that One more question. I was wondering what you thought of the tendency for man to uh, anthropomorphize God. It's said that God created man in his image, but it seems like man creates God in his image. As a ruler, as a king, maybe as a tyrant, all-powerful, and how that may warp really what God is really about. Well, I think it does warp. Human beings are... Um, John Calvin writes the most beautiful things about God's image in God's children, how human beings are created uh, to be like God. Um, and it, 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 it says it's almost as if God holds up a mirror and when God um, the mirror in front of us and in that mirror God sees reflected God's very own self. He writes very touching things about that. But you're right. Of course we have created a God in our own image. We have created a warrior God. We have created a bloodthirsty God um, in all manner of ways. We have created a God that we describe as omnipotent because we desire this omnipotence so much. Um, and if the king is the reflection of God, of course the king has to be omnipotent. Well, let me tell you uh, something. Uh, the Khoi Khoi people were uh, the first nations were together with the son of South Africa. And now the science tells us they were really the first people in the world. So they have an image of their God. They believed in a few pillars. They believed in uh, a supreme being. They believed in uh, the absolute interconnectedness between human beings and nature and the earth and they believed in the interconnectedness between human beings themselves. So they call themselves the Khoi Khoi. Khoi means people, but they say Khoi Khoi, so we are people, people, which means we are people because you affirm us as people. That old idea that I talked about this morning, so they are the Khoi Khoi. They talk about their supreme being, and the supreme being has a name. They call the supreme being so we go up, they have the cliques in their language. Now these are my ancestors, at least part of my heritage. I've got other parts of my heritage, so I'm a glorious mix of all sorts of people. Um, so, so, so we go up, they say, is the supreme being who created the heaven and earth and human beings and everything that's good. Uh, but Sui Goa 
has uh, an enemy, what we call the devil. They call the devil Gawab. So Gawab is the one who brings all manner of ill into people's lives. Gawa brings the storms, and Gawa brings the drought, and Gawa brings hatred amongst people, Gawa makes us hate one another, Gawa is the breaker of human community. And so one day, uh, God could not take this any longer, and God said to Gawa, you've got to stop this. Don't touch my people. And of course, Gawa challenged God, and so there was this struggle. Um, God won the struggle, Sui Goab. But they say Sui Goab came out of the struggle with a wounded knee because in standing in for God's people, God was wounded in the knee. So now the God is limping. It's not a supreme almighty being who just sweeps everything away in front of him and puts his fist down. This is a limping God. And they say he limps for another reason too because he knows that people hurt easily and that mostly we don't run through life. We limp through life. And so God is next to us, limping with us, walking through life at our pace so that we don't lose sight of God. So the very name Sui Goab means wounded knee. I think if we have that image of God as a, as a wounded God who limps because we limp and who walks with a limp because God does not want to outrun God's children so that we can keep up with God. If we have that image perhaps it will help us to better understand who God is and how we should be to each other. So remember, if you think of God, don't think of some mighty warrior who stands up and smites the world in power and violence. Think of Sui Goab, who limps with you so that you can keep up with him. Wow! Is that amazing? I just never tire of hearing him. Unfortunately, our time is coming to a close. And um, I want to thank all of you for being together with us here uh, at Craigside. Our thanks to Craigside, 15 Craigside, for opening up their space to us. Um, but most of all, I want to thank God for uh, a wonderful prophet in Alan Bozak and for sharing your time uh, with us. Thank you. Can we show again our appreciation? Um, I've asked the Reverend Richard Kamano, uh, Kahu Kamano, to give us the benediction for the day. I too want to thank you for coming and sharing with us. Um, it's always good when we're out here on the islands, and sometimes we 